If you have scripture today, I'd love for you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to find our text there as we bring this collection of talks, priorities to a close. And in it, we've seen a lot of things. In week one, we talked about discovering our purpose and allowing our purpose to rise up in our priorities. In the second week of it, we talked about numbering our days so that we can make sure that our lives count. And then last week, the line I loved in the talk the most was the one that just told us all that the most powerful word possibly in our vocabulary in 2023 is the little word no, because the little word no is going to open up for us a more powerful yes. And today, as we close the series, I want to talk about the priority of the gospel, And it may not seem like it fits in a beginning of the year series around ordering our lives around the things that matter most, but I'm telling you, there's nothing more important in your life and in my life and in our lives as Passion City Church than the gospel. This message is called the best and worst news you've ever heard. And I'm excited about it. The text opens this way in verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 15, a chapter. Is anybody familiar with 1 Corinthians 15? We read some of the text of this at Shelley's dad's celebration of life service just a few weeks ago. This is where you turn to find that powerful statement of God that says, where, O death, is your victory, and where, O death, is your sting. It's the chapter that gives us, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's an entire treatise on resurrection life. And the reason that this treatise is in scripture and particularly in this letter to the Corinthians is because in Corinth at the time were Romans and Greeks and there were Jews there as well. There was a synagogue. There were a lot of people from the East who had migrated there because of its importance as a trade location. But the Greek mindset was strong and the Greek mindset had come against the gospel the resurrection of Jesus, because Greeks valued the spirit, but they despised the flesh. And this idea that our bodies was actually be resurrected was distasteful to the Greek mindset. And so they were pushing back on the key hinge of our faith, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so Paul, led by the Holy Spirit, says, well, I'm going to write a chapter on the resurrection. And the chapter opens this way. He says, now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. More importantly, we're going to see in a moment the the tense there is you are being saved. It's a progressive work of God, recognizing that, yes, there's a moment where when you put your faith in Jesus, you're born again, but that's not the end of salvation. Salvation is a process where God is working out that new birth every single day of our lives. And he's saving us all the way to the end, even in the grave, he's saving us, is what Paul is going to ultimately get at in this chapter. He says, by this gospel, you are being saved. If you have ESV, I think it says being saved. If you have NIV, it just says you are saved. But underneath it in the Greek, you are being saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. Now that's why this text is in this collection. And that's why a message around the priority of the gospel is in this collection. When we started storyboarding this series of messages, I thought, you know, What is that text of first importance? I I, I looked for it, found it, and I was like, yes, the gospel is of first importance. In other words, when you look at that word priority, as we did last week, and you realize at its root, it comes from the prior thing or the first thing. Well, what Paul is saying is the first thing, the most important thing, the priority of all the things that I'm passing on to you is the gospel. And then he defines what it is, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. That's an important line. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter 
and then to the 12. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. Now, Paul is not saying he was born abnormal. He's just saying he was born at the wrong time so that he couldn't get in the sequence of these other people who Jesus appeared to. He was born a little bit out of the time sequence, but that didn't stop God from appearing to him also. And he says in verse nine, for I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Anybody have that story today? I mean, maybe some of you came from the right family and the right side of town and uh, your parents had the right name and you all had the right reputation and y'all were all the best people in the community and you were amazing when you grew up and when you met Jesus, it was like, of course I'm gonna meet Jesus and he's gonna bring me into heaven because look at me, you know, maybe you're that person or maybe there's something in your story that went a little sideways somewhere and you're like, you know what? Honestly, I don't even know how I got in this story. I don't even know how I'm here. I don't really even deserve to be called a child of God. But you know what? By the grace of God, I am what I am. By what God has done, I am what I am. Paul had this breathing in him, and he never lost sight of the power of the gospel that brought him from a nobody persecuting Christians into the family of God, proclaiming the very gospel of Jesus Christ that he was opposed to. He knew the power of the gospel. And therefore, when you read his life, there were a lot of things that were important to Paul, but nothing took priority over the gospel. Not in him personally and not in him publicly. He was stuck on the gospel. It was his priority. He said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. I cannot wait to, to talk about that in a moment. So I'll just talk about it now. <laughs> this powerful grace that God offered to me, it actually worked in me. This powerful grace that I got invited into, I didn't waste a bit of it. I didn't waste an ounce of it. I took hold of all of it, and it has done its thing in me and through me. There are a lot of people in the house today who love the grace of God, but it is without effect in the way that you have conducted your life. Oh, I love the grace of God. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. It saved a wretch like me. And God's like, yeah, I know. I, I wanted to save a wretch like you, but I also wanted to raise you up, empower you, fill you, use you, animate you, motivate you, and send you out in an amazing way to do great things in the name of Jesus. I wanted to have an effect on you. And Paul's saying, hey, by the grace of God, I am what I am, and I'm telling you, this grace to me was not without effect. He says, no, I worked harder than all of them. I mean, he, he named a pretty strong list of people, by the way. I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whew. Whether then it was I or they, this is what we preach, because this is our priority, and this is what you have believed the priority of the gospel. This message has a few implications, and the first one is this, that the gospel tells us that we could never be good enough for God. I need one amen. I need an amen. I don't need a lot, but I need an amen. I want to make this as clear as I can today. This story of God's grace makes it clear to you and me that you could never be good enough for God. Still got just one right. Well, are we processing that? Are we happy about that? Are we not that make us nervous? See, this is the, the best and the worst news you've ever heard. 
that you, and I just want to make it personal, even though I don't know you, I know enough about the gospel and I know enough about me to know enough about you. You could never be good enough for God. Now, that's the worst news you've ever heard. I'll tell you why. Um, simply put, it's the worst news you've ever heard because God is referred to three times only in one way. In fact, in Scripture, only one thing is tripled in, in Scripture, and it is the word holy. And the Scripture doesn't just say God is holy. It says that God is holy, holy, holy. Why? Because God wants us to fully come to terms with the fact that he is perfect and righteous and spotless and radiant. And he is, the word literally means other than us. He dwells, the scripture says, in unapproachable light. He is seated on a throne of thrones and lightning and thunder, they peel forth from his throne. At the sound of the seraphim who cry, holy, 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 the doorpost of the temple shook and the whole temple was filled with smoke. And when Isaiah had this vision, he fell down on the ground and he said, woe is me. And what God wants us to understand today is that you can't try your way to a God like that. See, the first thing, if priorities are about the first thing, well, here's the first thing. The first thing is God created Adam and Eve and they disobeyed him. And the penalty of that was death and separation from God and the paradise that he put them in. So from the very beginning, our major problem has been getting reconnected to God. But the difficulty is that even when he gave us 10 simple things, nobody could do them. So that's kind of the short answer to that question. Well, what do you mean we can't be good enough for God? Well, okay, I won't give you 100 things. I'm not even give you 50 things. I'm going to even give you 20 things. I'm going to give you 10 things. Oh, yeah, I can't do the 10 things. Right. I didn't give you the 10 things so I could know you can't do the 10 things. I gave you the 10 things so that you could know you can't do the 10 things, so that you could know you can't be good enough for God. And that's the worst news you've ever heard because he's holy, holy, holy. And when, he, when you get to a holy, holy God, I mean, if you look a few pages over when Paul's writing to the Corinthians again with his second letter in chapter five, it's interesting how all of our stories uh, come to end. Second Corinthians five, verse 10. For we must all, keyword, appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. There's a reckoning coming. There's a face-to-face -face coming. And that's why the fact that you can't be good enough for God is, is the worst news you've ever heard. Just stay with me for a minute. It's the worst because you and I are on a collision course with God. Every single human being is going to stand before God. And as much as it's worked in life <laughs> for us to sort of rationalize things away, it is not going to work when you are face to face with holy, holy, holy. You're not going to be able to say, well, you know, I knew you would understand when I got here that, you know, I was really trying super hard, but things were really difficult and I meant well and I know and you know and I, well, you, it's just not going to work. And God wants you to know that. And Paul wanted the Corinthians to know that. The Corinthians were a lot like us. Corinth is uh, in Greece and it's on a little isthmus. That's a hard word to say. 
a little skinny piece of land where there's water on both sides and ships would come from one side and they didn't want to go all the way around all of Greece so they would stop there and the little ships, they would put them on things that had rollers and they'd roll them across the little isthmus to the other water and the big ones, they just unload them and take the stuff across and reload it onto another ship. So you got people coming in here from all over the world. It was kind of the Las Vegas, if you will, of the ancient times. It was a city that was celebrated and known for its immorality. And that immorality had worked its way into the church. So the first few chapters of 1 Corinthians, you see Paul addressing a lot of these issues in the church. It was a cosmopolitan city where people would come and a lot of things were just incredibly evil there. There there was a temple on, on the top of a hill there and that temple was served not by pastors, but by prostitutes. And that was just what Corinth was known for. And so this letter isn't written to a little, you know, knitting Bible study group, you know, not that there's anything wrong with that. It was written to a real topsy-turvy urban jungle. And in it, Paul is wanting to communicate to people, hey, all of this, all of this is headed towards holy, holy, holy. And so God wants you to know that. And and even though it looks like the worst news because you're on a collision course with God, I also want you to know in some ways, and Paul helps us see this, it's the best news you've ever heard. You're like, Louis, how can the fact that I cannot be good enough for God be the best news I've ever heard? Because it gives you freedom today to know that right here today, you can stop trying. You can get off I can't draw a really good hamster, but you can get off. (laughs) That looks like a turtle. (laughs) They look a little more like a hamster now. The good news is, if you're on the hamster wheel, you can get off. Because you're not going to get good enough for God. You're not going to do enough religion. You're not going to do enough good deeds. You're not going to do enough self-improvement. You're not going to put enough checks on the good column to outweigh the ones on the bad column. That's not going to happen. So if you are trapped either on the treadmill of religion or on the hamster wheel of thinking, man, if I can just do a little bit more, maybe I can, you know, make it into the presence of a holy God. You can't. So you can, you can take that as good news today and say, wow, I can just quit trying to be good enough for God. Cause if I'm trying to be good enough to earn my standing before a holy God, that's not going to work. But here's the thing. You are still um, on a collision course (laughs) with God. So you can get off the wheel, but you can't get off the collision course with God. And so somehow both of these all have to resolve somewhere. And where are they going to resolve? They're going to resolve in the gospel. (laughs) Yeah, thank you. Multi-talented. They're going to resolve at the end of this chapter 5 in 2 Corinthians, where Paul writes, God made him, Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us. So that in him, in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. You say, Louis, I thought God was gracious and this holy, holy, holy is scaring me. Well, God is gracious. And you don't have to be scared by the holy, holy, holy. Because he is holy. And he is gracious. He's gracious and holy. And they both came together at the place where Jesus died. When he became sin for us so that in him we could become the righteousness of God. So how do I get to a holy God? I got to become holy. 
It's the only way. Can't be good enough. How do I get holy? I get in the holy one. So when Peter writes, be holy as I am holy, that's God. That's the standard, be holy as I am holy. Then you gotta start asking the question, how do I get holy? And the only way to get holy is to come into a relationship with the one who became sin so that you could become the righteousness of God in him. You can never be good enough for God. It's the best and worst news you've ever heard. The second implication is this. The gospel is our foundation. It's not just something that we believe in. The gospel is something that we stand on. He says this in verse 1 of of chapter 15. I want to remind you of the gospel, the good news, the story of what Jesus has done. This gospel that I preach to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. And I just want to emphasize again today is we're heading into a new year. In 2023 at Passion City Church, the gospel will be the priority. You will hear about the gospel every time you come to Passion City Church, because it's not just something we received, it's something that we stand on, and that's different. And I just want to call out that little subtle difference today because there are a lot of people who say, oh, I've heard of Jesus and I've heard of the cross and I've heard of his death and I've heard of resurrection and I have actually received that. I prayed a prayer or filled out a card or checked a box or texted into a number. I've received that. And he's like, great, that's awesome that you received it. But here's what I really need you to be doing. I need you to be standing on it. I need it to be the pedestal of your life, if you will. So that it is the thing that you want to be known for. It is the thing that you take your hope in. It is where you find your sure foundation and your anchor point is this. I was dead, but now I am alive. I don't have any business being called a child of God, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And it is not going to lose its effect on me. I don't know if it's popular to talk about the gospel, but I'm going to stand on it. I don't know if everybody wants to hear about the gospel, but I'm going to stand on it. I don't know what you're going to stand on, but I'm going to keep standing on the gospel. I'll tell you, the thing coming against the church is simply this. It is to undermine the word of God so that then we can water down the person and the work of Jesus so that we can eliminate the need for the gospel. This is what is happening in the world. Do not be distracted by other things. I'm not saying the other things are not important. I'm just saying that the end game that the Antichrist is after is Christ. And the thing we will prioritize is Christ. The thing we will amplify is the gospel because we believe Jesus is the only unique son of God given to take away the sins of the world. And we know this primarily because of the scriptures. And this is where we stand. We just humbly stand here. And humbly stand here. The third implication that I think is important in verse 2 is that you see that the same gospel that saved you is the gospel that sustains you. In other words, there's not a separation from what God did to get you to heaven and what God wants to do to get you through Thursday. It's the same grace. You're like, no, that was saving grace. Well, guess what you need on Thursday? You need saving grace on Thursday. And that's what he says in verse two. And that's why it's important that we get the tense of this verb right. By this gospel, what gospel? This good news that Jesus became sin so that we could become the righteousness of God in him. This gospel, by this gospel, you are being saved. You're being saved. Now, 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 don't get lost in, in this whole verse about, you know, can I lose my salvation or not? The best answer to that question, by the way, is I don't know. Are you trusting Jesus right now to be your savior? Yes. Great. That's what you need to bank on. And, and I don't want to get down to the fine notes of this. I believe I was saved at 11, if not before, when I put my faith in Jesus, made a decision in front of my church and told the pastor and everybody clapped. 
I believe I was saved that day. But if you ask me, Louis, how do you know you're saved? I'm not gonna go, oh, when I was 11 years old, I went down the aisle at First Baptist Church and I shook the pastor's hand, filled out a card on a clipboard and told a deacon that I wanted to be saved. And that's how I know I'm saved. No, I would say I I know I'm saved because I'm a 64-year-old man standing here before you today putting my entire trust in the finished work of Jesus to bring me into a new relationship with God, to make me holy, and to bring me out of the grave and into the presence of God. And if you have any other story than that, I, I can't really get around and applaud that. I'm sorry. Well, I, you know, I don't know where I am right now, but I know when I was eight, you know, I prayed a prayer. I'm like, man, I'd be more focused on where you are right now than where you were when you were eight and you prayed a prayer. You were eight months old and they prayed one over you. God is putting the gospel before you. And he doesn't want you just to hear about it. Doesn't really even want you just to believe it and even receive it. He wants you to stand on it, and he wants you to know that it is operational power and the same power. I'm telling you, we are far more confident in God getting us out of a grave and into heaven than we are getting us through the business meeting we got to go through tomorrow. We should walk into that meeting and go, man, I need to be saved today. Oh, not the kind like out of death and into eternal life. I just need your operational power, that same grace. I need that grace today. And I thank you that it is available to me because I am being saved. You understand what I'm saying? Not that the moment you put your faith in Jesus, you're not born again. I believe you are born again when you legitimately put all of your trust in Jesus. But it is a process whereby that being born again continues to save you every single day of your life until you stand before God blameless in Christ and you are more saved on that day than you were on that day. Maybe not technically spiritually, somebody will quote me on that, but you realize your salvation more on that day than you did on any other day. That's the day that you go, whoa, this salvation thing is crazy. Because I am, it, it, it worked. I'm standing before holy, 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 and I didn't get incinerated instantly. But I was covered by the grace of God. God wants you to know that if you believe His grace is powerful enough to get you to heaven. Please believe it's powerful enough to get you through the season that you're in right now. The fourth implication is that grace is a waterfall to be lived under every day of your life. Again, same principle just cut to the heart of it. I think when we come to that moment of I need to be saved, and I I would imagine somebody today needs to be saved. You, You know, if the Holy Spirit really gave us revelation sight about the gospel and our participation in it, I I would suspect a hundred people, hundreds of people would get saved today. Because you're like, I've been around it. I I like it. I I actually received it. I did fill out one of those things at some point, or I did text something in, but I I don't know for sure if I could say 1,000% right now, I know that I am fully trusting Jesus' finished work for my salvation now and every single step of my life. And I want to make that clear because I see the gospel. But I, I also want you to know that in that first moment, we, we, we believe, wow, God is forgiving me of all my sins. And we might even tell somebody that. I, I became a Christian. I was born again. I, I got saved. Uh, God forgave me. I realized what the, the work of the, of the cross was when it was laid over my life. And I'm like, man, Jesus forgives. But then from that moment on, people live out of a sense of religion or under the tyranny of shame and guilt. And I'm telling you, God wants the gospel to have its full effect on you. And if there's one thing that we're going to say no to from our priorities talk last week in 2023, may it be that somebody says no to the master called shame. No to the master called, I don't know if I'm ever going to, you know, measure up to God. And I don't mean that in the sense of being good enough to, to stand in the presence of a holy God. I mean, just whether or not God ever really approves of you or not. And some of us are living behind the eight ball of guilt and shame, and we don't feel like 
we really good enough to even belong at the table with God? And he's saying, no, I want you to understand what Paul said. I am what I am by the grace of God, and I'm going to let this grace have full effect. That means I'm going to get in the river of God's grace, and I'm going to let it carry me on through my days as a loved, forgiven, accepted, welcome son or daughter of God who's been washed clean, made brand new, got the Holy Spirit living inside of me, calling me up to become everything that God intended me to be and conforming me to the very likeness of Jesus Christ. I am saved, and because of that, I am free from the tyranny of guilt. And the inferiority complex of never thinking that I belong at the table of God. It's like going to Victoria Falls. Shelly and I have been there a few times where Zimbabwe and Botswana come together. And this massive river is coming over the falls. And it's so expansive that there's just a mist there. You can be a half mile away and the, the mist will blow on you. Because the amount of water that's coming over this sheer drop into this gorge, and it's just mist rising up. The roar is there, and then the river is formed, the Zambezi River, and it is class four, class five, and above class, off the chart class rapids. I don't know why we went down it in a raft that you blew up with a pump and air, but we did. And I'm telling you, the whole way down it, it's nothing. I mean, there are a few calm places, but those are just to recover and put bandages on things that got injured in the last thing you went through. And it is so powerful and so forceful. And God is saying, this is my grace in your life. You can just, if you're standing around it, the mist is going to get on you. If you're standing around it, the sound of it is going to rattle you from the inside out. When you get in it, it's a current that's going to take you downstream with the grace of God. You're in the river. You're not rowing upstream going, God, I hope you love me. God, I hope, I hope you love me. God, I hope you can accept me and I hope I'm okay. No effect. Turn the boat around and let the current of the finished work of Jesus get down inside your bones and move you through life. The last implication, I'll just close quickly, is the obvious one, and that is that whatever our biggest priority is, is what we're going to pass on to the people around us. If you are planning a trip to Sweden or Norway or somewhere else, awesome. Uh, I bet your friends have heard about it. Yes, we're planning on going to Norway. We're going to Sweden. You're not going to believe we're going to go here. Look at that. Is that not incredible? No, no, no. Check that out. Yeah, that's where we're going to stay right there. Whatever is your priority. If you're still working out in February, I guarantee you everyone (laughs) in your sphere knows about it. (laughs) People you know and people you don't know. You checking out Publix? Be anything else? No, I'm good. Big workout this morning. (laughs) Checker's like, great. Whatever is our priority, other people know about. Right? I hope and pray that the gospel will become our priority in 2023. You can count on it. We're not just preaching a story, we're preaching what the scriptures say. He died for our sins according to the scriptures, not according to me. He was raised up from the dead according to the scriptures, not according to me. And thankfully, God made it easy because Paul said, and he appeared to different groups of people, but one time he appeared to 500 people at the same time, and most of them are still alive. That's the best preaching you can do right there when you are preaching resurrection to a people who don't really want to believe in it, but you got 500 people who actually were eyewitnesses to Jesus being raised from the dead. So even here, Paul wasn't saying, hey, man, I don't know. You just got to trust me on this one. He's like, no, there, there were 500 people at one time that saw Jesus, and most of them are still alive. But what you come to understand is pretty sobering, and it is that people without 
Jesus are not bad people. They're not really even lost people. They're spiritually dead people. You're like, well, Louis, I can't work that out. And I know it's, it's, it's very um, convicting. Say, well, th- this is all good for me, Louis, and it's all good for us here at Passion City Church. But you know, that. Well, can I just encourage us that this letter was not written to us? <laughs> I mean, it is, but specifically it was written to Corinth in Greece, in the middle of the greater Mediterranean on a little isthmus of land which is not too far from Athens which was the intellectual center of the world written by a man named Saul who came from Tarsus if you didn't know which is one of the cities in the earthquake stricken region of Turkey his home So this message, this message is for everybody. Holy, holy, holy created everybody. And his will is that they all will come to know this gospel. And so I'm telling you, it has got to move up my priority list and in 2023 I've got to be found in it on it being saved by it being animated by it but I've got to be found praying for people without Jesus and if that's not on the top of my priority list for this year, then please tell me what is. And I want to be like my brother who said, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, the first thing. On my list of things is what I received. I want to pass it on to you. I I don't know if you want to receive it. I don't even know if you want to hear it. I'm sure that in our culture, you know, the the mantra of the day is, hey, I don't want to hear anything that makes me feel bad. Don't try to make me feel bad. I don't want anybody making me feel bad. And I just want to answer back and say, I'm telling you, as God's people and ambassadors of this amazing gospel of grace, I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad. I'm just trying to help everybody see that we're spiritually dead. But there is something called resurrection in the story. And his name is Jesus. And he brings me to life spiritually now, and he brings me to life physically at the end of this story, and he brings everyone to life that puts their hope in him. I want to pray for people without Jesus at the top of my list, and I want to pass on the gospel at the top of my list, and I wonder, can we lean into that, Passion City? Can we lean into that today? We are going to be a church that prays for people who don't know Jesus like their eternity depends on it. And we're gonna pass on this gospel. Yeah, we're gonna let the Holy Spirit do the rest. We will plant the seed, we will say the word, we will share the link, we will give somebody a, a resource, we will tell our story if we get the opportunity. There's a, there's a hundred ways you can tell the gospel story to someone that you love and are praying for. And you can do it over time with somebody you work with or you can do it in two minutes if you get that opportunity with somebody in an airport or in the line at a grocery store. Just when the moment comes and you have that one little opportunity to pass on what you have received as a first importance and then just say, you know what? Holy Spirit, this has all been about you anyway, so I'm not in charge of what happens to the message. I'm just in charge of passing on the message. So I'm going to pass it on, and I'm going to let you do what you want to do with the result. But I'm going to pass it on, believing that a lot of people are looking for peace 
They already know the best and worst news they've ever heard is that you can't be good enough for God. They're just wondering how you get peace about the resolution of those two things. And to see how a holy God and a gracious God can be the same God, especially when you see them in the face of Jesus giving his life for us on a cross, buried and raised from the dead by the power of Almighty God. I invite you to the gospel. And I invite us to prioritize the gospel in Jesus' name.